Welcome to the next episode of Microsoft EduTech Kit podcast, produced by us in Microsoft, where we discuss and explore education best practices with exceptional and experienced guests. I'm Diana Razarian, industry advisor with Microsoft Education team, responsible for Central Europe. And in my role, I constantly engage with ministries, with educators and students to help them in their journey of digital transformation. So in this episode, I will be joined with two experienced educators with whom I look forward to talking to. So let me introduce Stevi Natardu, representing Natardu School in Greece that was established back in 1949. And the school is the Microsoft Showcase School, one of those 300 schools around the globe that are closely working with Microsoft. And our next guest is Maya Olszewska from Artes Liberales High School in Poland, the school that makes a lot of emphasis on emotional and social development, which is very important these days. So let me thank you ladies for being with us today on this podcast. Uh, before we jump into our topic, which is the innovation in, in K-12, I uh, would appreciate if you give a little bit of intro of yourself. Hello, uh, it's lovely to participate in this podcast and Thank you for inviting me. My name is David Linardatu. I'm a mathematics teacher and the deputy director of Afgulea Linardatu School. I followed my family's legacy by choosing to become an educator. And after a year of teaching, I remember that I realized that a major reform was needed in the way our students experienced learning, both inside and outside the classroom. So now my goal is to find ways to arouse our students' interest, to engage them in the construction of knowledge and to empower them by developing 21st century skills. Thank you, Stevie. And Maya, how about you? Hello, myself, I have a more of an academic background. I used to work in international relations at um, an international institution training uh, diplomatic staff. Uh, in the context of the European Union, but education has been close to my heart in all possible ways because I've been also teaching English. I'm also um, a yoga and Pilates teacher. So working with people for people and trying to see how human development in all life stages, in all possible ways, be it spirit, be it intellectual, be it emotional, be it knowledge, can work together in synergies. And I, I have great privilege and and I must say pleasure to have been invited to join this unbelievable project, which is Liceo Martes Liberas in Warsaw by three um, well-established educators who at the moment of their respective crises and career in public education decided to almost drop out, but then instead turning their disappointment or fatigue into creating a school that they would want to attend. So school of their dreams, which I must say is an excellent and advantageous journey and uh, at the same time full of challenges and and I will be more than happy to share both with you today. Thank you to both of you. So ladies, there are so many talks around the innovation in, in education and we have been seeing a lot of changes throughout the several years, but especially after the COVID. So I wanted to clarify what is the teaching method that each of your schools have decided to take on and what was the why you selected specifically that one? For us, innovative teaching consists of a combination of different traditional and more modern approaches that stimulate student engagement and increase intellectual growth by being more flexible and more tailored to the student's needs. So the central aim is one, lead students through curiosity and team spirit to a point where they can build their knowledge uh, autonomously. And of course, there is no exact shortcut or magic trick to capture a classroom's attention, let alone convey ideas effectively. Nevertheless, we try every year to deploy various strategies that are suitable for each subject and for each learning goal. And sometimes that involves experimenting with trial and error after several iterations. We have now reached a point where we mostly focus on three learning uh, strategies, which are personalized learning, project-based learning, and flip the classroom. When it comes to personalized learning, this approach emphasizes tailoring education to the pain points strengths and interests of individual students. So rather than using a single average approach 
or plan to teach an entire class, teachers try to adjust the capabilities of each student and they try to help them to either achieve uh, subject proficiency or grade level benchmarks. And that way, an inclusive yet differentiated environment can be designed. So, for example, in our school, educators try to identify students at different levels according to their most recent grades. And then they create individual pathways that are targeted to their unique needs by assigning different homework to each student. And as a result, they manage to leverage mixed groups to best support student learning. About project-based learning, this is actually one of the most interesting methods that we have adopted recently. This approach basically encourages students to learn through the completion of real-world projects that require, though, uh, the 21st century skills, meaning critical thinking, self-regulation, communication, digital skills, problem solving. So I'll, I'll give uh, a few examples uh, that have taken place in our school uh, over the past few years. A group of middle schools collaborated uh, in researching uh, the traffic and parking problems in our area in Berseri. And then they constructed relevant questionnaires and conducted polls within the local community. Based on their findings, they developed individual and integrated solutions. They built a Minecraft world of our area uh, based on their proposed solutions, and then they presented this project to the local stakeholders. That was an interesting uh, project that we did. And another example, after uh, researching local health diagnostic centers, some of our high school students created a startup that developed a procedure of uh, recycling x-ray films. They basically developed a method they had learned in chemistry of recovering the silver used to produce x-ray films. And then they spent the proceeds to buy and donate laptops for the Old People Recreational Center in our area. And as a last step, they designed lesson plans and they instructed the elderly in the use of the internet. Another more recent example, this is actually taking place right now. We have a few students who carried out research using statistical data from the Ministry of Tourism. Tourism in our country is still not developed a lot, and if developed, could lead to a year-round influx of tourists in Greece. And they came to the conclusion that such an area could be religious tourism. So they researched a large number of eons-old monasteries, churches, and shrines all over Greece. They collated their history and as we speak, are in the process of creating a bookings.com type of website. They named it Holidays, as in H-O-L-Y, to promote and facilitate visiting them. So overall, teaching with project-based learning definitely links students and teachers to their communities and the outside world, demonstrating how all disciplines are basically interlinked and creating opportunities to experience real situations rather than contrived examples. And the last strategy, which is flip the classroom, which is a quite a common one uh, nowadays, for somebody who is not aware of the concept, in this model, students basically learn new content at home, mostly through pre-recorded lessons or readings, and then they come to class and they try to apply and practice what they have learned at home. So, for example, in one of our science classes, students usually watch at home a, a video about living microorganisms and the importance of sampling and conservation. And then they come to school, they move to the lab where they carry out on their own an experiment of observing and recognizing a trohono, which is uh, multicellular and feeds on organic residues filtering fresh water. So these are the three main strategies that we mostly focus on right now. We have similar teaching methods, in, in fact, because I could also say, speak about personalized track, about group work and about flipped classroom, which we also apply. So maybe instead of going into depth of about what this is, as my predecessor already mentioned a couple of things, I'll try to put it more in the specific context of our project, of our school. First of all, as you were so kind to say, uh, Diana, uh, we are very 
new school we were established last year. So actually, we were having only the first classes now, the first grades. This means that all that was said about flip classroom and project management is also something that has not been institutionally established. There's no path dependency because we're training and we're learning as we go. We have a couple of uh, educational pedagogical assumptions and we're trying to include it. But what is, I think, super exceptional about LAL is that our students have this amazing, unique opportunity to create the program of four years or a certain uh, benchmarks or, or patterns for the next uh, promotions to come. And I talk to them as we go. I say, okay, this is what I planned. Uh, we do certain things. We learn about monitoring, planning, scheduling, about group communication. And every now and then I ask them for feedback and I try to ask them, is it, does it make sense actually what I do? Uh, can you follow? Can you even relate of what I say, how it connects to what you're supposed to do? Do you find it helpful? Because so much on and on again, it perpetuates in education and everywhere. It has been done this way before and it has worked. Or from my perspective, me being on that age, I would have understood. But these kids today, they're totally different. They the Knowledge is not, this is one of the other assumptions that I should mention, knowledge is not a silos anymore. It's not that you have four books for four grades and in all of them, everything they're supposed to know is contained. Actually, they're overstimulated and massively attacked by different stimuli factors and knowledge all over the place. Our parents used to work from nine to five. They don't work from nine to five. They work in all different places, commuting in the metro, working on their laptops uh, remotely in the office. They don't spend in the same institutions 40 years or, or 20 years of their careers. They will be changing. So. Our assumption is also that we need to communicate with them. We need to explain to them why we're doing certain things the way we're doing them. This should somehow mirror how reality of work today looks like. So prepare them, not only knowledge wise, but also show them that there's certain mode of communication and work that is going to be probably expected of them on different life stages. And we want to prepare them too, but most of all make them aware. And so we do project work. We try asynchronic work. So for example, we have normal classes scheduled per week. And then for example, this year in January, in the beginning of the year, there was a week when we assumed that after New Year's Eve, some students might still go on skiing, be on holidays with their parents. So instead of asking them to come back to school, we decided to plan certain things for this week unusually and ask them to do asynchronic uh, work, meeting up online once in a while trying to ask them to deliver certain outputs by a certain deadline. We use flipped classroom. We actually uh, are the very first school, very proud of that, by the way. We're the very first school, I think, in Poland, which cooperates with a professional learning designer. Learning design is actually a thing now. We have our dear colleague, Przemek, who is alumnus, I'm sorry, of uh, Harvard University, and he currently resides in Boston and teaches there as, as a fellow researcher. And he cooperates with us in terms of newest research trends, let's say, in education, what works, what doesn't work. Cool calling in the class. Cool calling meaning randomly picking students and taking them out of the comfort zone. Is it encouraging or is it, you know, invoking fear and, and putting their willingness and their pleasure in learning and being exposed to conversation and this learning space uh, at question because they withdraw. So, well, the question is always how to find a balance or maybe some synergy between giving them this digital skills, which are absolutely inevitable, uh, indispensable today. And in the same time, make sure that they do show up, that they do spend time together, that they do look each other in the eyes, that they show each other's care, affection, determination, feedback, and they, they build their resilience in human contact. And this is a huge topic, especially for my school, when we try to tackle it in a very systematic planned way. I think we find it also a skill to work with the other person in today's world, in the digital globalized era. We believe strongly that academic development somehow should be based on or preceded, or maybe is being fed by personal growth and a feeling of belonging. Davey, given that your school is the showcase school, I would like also to hear uh, about the technology. How do you see how you use technology in this new way of, of doing things? There's a growing consensus among educators and researchers that widely used learning strategies are no longer sufficient 
to motivate students in this ever-changing world. And this is mostly because students today are exposed to a wide range of digital media and technology outside the classroom. This technology usually provides them with highly immersive and interactive experiences that are just very difficult to replicate within a traditional classroom setting. And this gap in stimuli uh, can lead to disengagement, boredom, or even frustration sometimes among students who just struggle to see the relevance and the applicability of what they're learning at school. And to address this gap, educators are increasingly turning to teaching methods that can leverage technology. And in our school, several Microsoft tools have been integrated in order to improve learning outcomes and serve the teaching methods that I mentioned previously, and most importantly, personalized learning. And I could give a holistic example by simply describing how a typical classroom session is usually divided into four different stages and how the structure of the lesson plan, which is distributed via the class notebook, is designed so that it serves each stage's purposes, meaning each of the teaching methods. So in the first stage of a typical class, we usually focus on checking the comprehension of the previous lesson. And now we do that sometimes via a forms quiz. And forms also involves um, the branching functionality, which basically allows students to progress at their own pace only once they have demonstrated mastery of a concept or a skill. So therefore, the teacher can assign a forms quiz in the classroom, give his students some time to answer uh, the quiz, and at the same time, the teacher can monitor their uh, scores uh, while they submit them live. And one of the most important characteristics of this tool is the fact that it directly extracts a statistical analysis of the results, which offers a double advantage to the educator. On the one hand, it saves him valuable teaching time because the correction is made automatically while at the same time, it offers him the opportunity to have an insight into each student's learning path individually and act accordingly through targeted feedback in order to eliminate gaps and misconceptions. So again, personalized learning. The aim of the second stage is usually to monitor how students have progressed with their homework. And as you may know, within the class notebook of each grouping teams, automatically a personal notebook has been created for each student. And in this personal notebook, we have the homework subunit where students write on a daily basis down their homework using uh, their active pens. And that way the teacher can in real time before class supervise whether students have been consistent with their obligations and accordingly make communications through the private chat of Microsoft Teams with those who haven't completed their homework. And secondly, and most importantly, identify key areas that need further support and consolidation, and as a next step, offer differentiated feedback using scaffolded instructions. And these instructions could be illustrated in various formats, either by typing them, dictating them, recording them, writing them using ink or inserting pictures or videos. Again, <laughs> personalized learning. And during the third stage, we usually focus on the knowledge construction of a new concept using our e-learning material. And we always try to accommodate uh, an inclusive environment when we create such a lesson plan. And how do we do that? The content of each unit is available in the content library prior to the scheduled class so that students with learning difficulties such as dyslexia or ADHD or even visual impairment may use the accessibility tools of the class notebook so that they can customize the lesson plan and adjust it to their needs. So for example, they could use Immersive Reader in order to convert text to speech at varying speeds or by different voices or change the color or text of, of the size of the text or even highlight syllables, nouns, verbs, and adjectives. So they can use all these tools. And this is very useful, especially when you try to apply the flip to the classroom mentality, because uh, what we usually do is that we post the next day's lesson and that way we give more time to students to with learning difficulties to use the immersive reader at home and listen and practice reading difficult words, get a first feeling of the new uh, concept, 
And that way they become more confident and they can participate more actively in the classroom. I wanted to clarify from both of you ladies, how do you see the teacher professional development? Because sometimes teachers are falling a little bit behind in terms of looking globally, you know, in terms of utilizing the technology in the classroom. And Maya, I wanted to to touch upon this topic with you. How does teachers are, are being, you know, uh, helped and supported from the leadership in terms of being able to bring this technological skills and knowledge and be able to deliver the classes? Well, to answer your question, one of our key assumptions at La is that we combined, we say in Polish, which will not sound that good in English, but let's say it's the protein, which means organic life, and silicon, which means high tech and innovation. And so these are our two pillars. And this is how we, we see the gate uh, to education at La. Um, so from the very beginning, we have been considering the usage of various tools and introducing our teachers to the system, I think is one of the key and most important preparations that needs to be done, but it's also an ongoing lesson. It's an ongoing work, simply because we come from different work environments. We are also a generation that did not grow up with these tools. We come to understand them, we come to use them. And if we cannot show best practices to our students, if we cannot stay consistent with using channels, with using tools, with using communication threads, then we cannot really expect them to do that. We do online courses, we have meetings, gatherings, when we try to take part in workshops or, or see li real life examples of how certain things can be done. We also engaged in uh, a specific course that was prepared by our learning designer which sort of mirrored a process of preparation of certain educational activities or materials from other side. So we were, in fact, those who were seeing how a potential student can experience, receive, understand, or encounter challenges in certain ways of having tasks. So for example, seeing the video, having deadline, not having deadline, being obliged to source from a certain source to do an exercise. And the tendency is to be more and more student focused, to be more individualistic, to take all kinds of learning difficulties into the spotlight, but also at the same time, being aware that at some point, these kids will leave the premises and need to send them into the world that's not going to be so particularly attentive to their needs anymore. But I think what is important, again, is that we expect of them knowledge and skills and application of tools which we ourselves are able to employ. Maybe how do you integrate the technology with the, you know, professional development, how we engage parents into this process? One of our main models is pave the path of change by putting people first. We've learned the hard way that even the coolest technology will fail in practice if students, teachers and parents do not feel that it supports the work and that it allows them to implement their ideas more easily and more effectively. It's clear that the vision of the school needs to be shared by all stakeholders. Uh, it truly takes a village to make it happen. So on the grounds of this mentality, we decided approximately 15 years ago to set up a professional development strategy for our 160 educators. So. More specifically, we set up a team of trainers, pioneering team of trainers, who took on the responsibility of training our entire staff on new apps and software that have the potential to improve the learning experience, both inside and outside the classroom, at an individual level. During the early stages of this process, teachers needed to feel that they can explore, observe, learn from each other and support each other, as well as fail without repercussions. And we gave them the space and time to do that. Back in 2014, we were firstly accepted into the Microsoft Soke School community. And we have been an active member of this community ever since. And last year in 2022, 119 educators were certified as Microsoft Innovative Expert Educators. We have 13 trainers, three fellows, three gl global Minecraft mentors, and 40 Microsoft certified educators. So I think that these certifications actually prove the effort that was put into this direction. Both of you have been kind of underlying the importance of the change management. This is what I'm hearing, you know, because this should be one of the key things when you bring the change, 
a lot of people would be, you know, trying to to push it back and not really embrace. What would be your, you know, one of the projects that you are just, you know, love and and would like to replicate in the future or would like to spread the word about it? Please, my, you are raising your hand. <laughs> We uh, have another motto. It's a key issue, really that learning is everything and school can be anywhere. So we actually introduce a lot of innovation in terms of both formats and places of where we learn. So one thing being school is everywhere. So we have every week one day in the timetable, which is devoted entirely to being outside of school. We learn in the park, we learn in the zoo, we learn in the lab, we learn in a pharmacy, we learn in a cinema, we learn in a, in the company, we learn at the train station, we go out, We meet people, we see how they work, we see how they employ their skills, what kind of skills these are, what kind of knowledge this is. This sounds extremely attractive, but believe me, if this becomes a regular thing every week, you actually need to fight with this very excited initially teenagers to make them walk around town in the rain or stay focused in a place which does not have as many stimuli as they normally receive sitting in front of a computer or with their smartphones. At the same time, we also try to bring the world into the school. So we take our students out into the world and we try to bring world into the school. And we don't do it only online. We're trying to actually teach them about contemporaneity, meaning all the current affairs in the country, in the world, everything that we hear in the news, read on the front pages of magazines, our parents are talking about it, inflation, energy crisis, another war breaking out, a refugee crisis, artificial intelligence, all of this little aspect which we somehow know exist, but we have never been educated or introduced to them properly. And we're being massively attacked by different pieces of information and we cannot even distinguish which are fake, which are real. So what we do at LAL, we introduce this new subject, new program, we call it contemporaneity, so current affairs. And we every week choose a topic which is currently important. A report has come out, a terrorist attack happened somewhere. There is a technological innovation. Uh, there is a huge inflation uh, in the country or elsewhere. I don't know, a bank collapsed and this has repercussions for the financial market. So we invite a speaker or two, people whose professions these are, people who are experts in their domain. And we ask them in a moderated conversation to explain the fundamentals of the given topic so that students have a validated, verified, which is super important, base knowledge, and they, they, they can decide for themselves if they want to pursue so, uh, researching, reading, reading or not. And this is something I'm very proud of because I think this is greatly missing in, in the systematic education. One of my favorite projects, which I'm most proud of, is the implementation of the one-to-one -one learning model in our middle school. For anyone who may not be familiar with the term, one-to-one -one refers to an educational, educational environment where each participant, student or teacher, owns a device that meets specific technical requirements and provides interconnectivity between teachers and students and utilizes other digital tools, including the cloud and collaborating platforms such as Teams. So we first hope to introduce this new project back in 2019-2020. But we all have parents and colleagues in our circle of family, friends and work who usually question Uh, such new school programs. And for students before the 90s, it can be very confusing, the mixture of teaching methods with technology at that level. And I can understand that habits are hard to break and even teachers can be confronted with the concern for the unknown as our teachers did, had never entered a classroom where students are working with a device. And indeed, when one has grown up with a classical teaching method, it's difficult to project oneself uh, into another model. So therefore, there was some initial resistance to moving forward with this new learning model. But then COVID-19 happened. And just one day after the lockdown of schools in Greece, the educational process at our school had to shift to remote learning, both synchronously and asynchronously taking advantage of the Microsoft Teams platform and the accounts and the devices that were already available to teachers. And since then, the curriculum of all subjects was promoted linearly, 
all students were being supported on a daily basis, both cognitively and psychologically. Video calls were conducted, questions were resolved, homework was assigned, exercises were graded, live connections with guest speakers were implemented in order to break down the walls of a classroom. As a result, a typical day of distance instruction at our school included about, I think, 7,700 one-to-one messages, about 27,000 channel messages, and 1,500 video calls. So basically, this transitory experience, though very traumatic in many ways, allowed everyone in our school community to understand that, in, in this instance, distance learning can take the role of covering the physical distance between the walls of a classroom and their students' homes. And as a next step, they could give a clear shot and opportunity to the revolutionary concept of one-to-one as it did not seem that scary anymore. And also, they could now finally detect the benefits of this program. I feel strongly that after, especially after COVID-19, schools need to become more rebellious in a way by challenging uh, the traditional education models, by prioritizing individualized learning trajectories, and by adjusting the level of difficulty and the pace of activities based on student profile and previous performance. It's clear enough that the future of learning and teaching will be inevitably heavily shaped by the increasing use of technology. And with the rapid advancements in AI and VR, the possibilities of transforming a classroom are already vast. But the key to success is finding the optimal equilibrium point between the usage of technology and personal interaction. As technology alone could never replace the human connection nor the guidance of a skilled teacher who truly cares for his students. So when it comes to our uh, next steps for the next perhaps five years, we have three goals in mind. The first one I would love to explore how our curriculum could emphasize more sustainability and the protection of the environment by designing activities and field trips such as farming and eco-design. And this is not very popular in Greece yet, so I feel like we need to tap more into this. Another direction that we are interested in is creating a school in the cloud, meaning that we could provide top quality 360 education to students in remote areas of Greece. I believe that we could harness our technological expertise and know-how in order to support such students and thus eliminate inequities that unfortunately still exist for many kids in our country. And um, last but not least, I feel the need to integrate even more social and emotional learning projects so that our students can manage better their emotions, build healthy relationships and develop a positive image of themselves. I think these are crucial elements for their future in any way. And I feel also that had schools invested more on this prior to the pandemic, students would have been better equipped to handle the aftermath challenges and so do adults. Definitely the social emotional aspect would be very important for all of us. This is amazing to see how you both, your schools are getting prepared the students for the future, for, to be armed with the future skills, let me put it this way, to be able to succeed, get whatever comes, and they would have this confidence in themselves that they would be able to overcome it. Thank you so much once again uh, for being with us. And for those who are watching us, we look forward to seeing you again on our EduTech Kit with the next episodes coming in. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank Thank you so much. It was a lovely discussion. Thank you.